Tonight you're witnessing something of a historic moment. This is the first time for me to actually present during the corporate worship. Uh, I've done devos before uh, back at school, and I've spoken to more uh, people in, during de devotionals uh, back at Free Hardman whenever I was a student there. But tonight is the first for me to do something like this. So bear with me. I, I prayed for Brother Stewart whenever I was out, and now I'm hoping Brother Stewart's praying for me while he is out. Um, make good choices. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, choices and the consequences of the choices that we make sometimes. Free will is cherished by human beings. Uh, those that um, can think intelligently, we're able to make decisions. And sometimes the decisions that we make, they can be good decisions, they can be bad decisions. Sometimes we don't know that they're a bad decision until we experience the consequences of those decisions. Um, of course, as uh, teenagers in this life, we generally learn what consequences are because that's whenever we have a little bit more freedom to decide what we'd like to do. And um, uh, hopefully those consequences are ones that, that can be borne by the teenager and that they can learn from. As has been said, with freedom of choice comes the consequence of that choice, good or bad. We're going to look at uh, three stories tonight. There are, of course, numerous examples in the scripture of uh, people that have made good decisions and bad decisions and have borne uh, the benefit of those decisions or suffered the consequences. But we're going to start off with Adam and Eve. And then look at Nadab and Abihu, and finally we're going to spend the remainder of our time with Hophni and Phineas. What you're going to see throughout these stories is a command that God has made, a choice that one of these individuals make, and then the consequence of that choice. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. God says, I made all of these trees in the Garden of Eden for you to eat of. You can eat of every one of them except for one. That would be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The command has been set forth. And Adam and Eve eventually make the choice in Genesis 3, 6 to go ahead and eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve is right there with Adam, and she hands the fruit on over to Adam, and they both partake. They both choose to disobey the command that God set forth, and the consequence, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and they lose the close relationship, that walking in the Garden with God, the communion that they had with God, that was a loss. That was a consequence of their decision. Moving on then to Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron, and as a reminder, Aaron was the high priest of Israel, and Nadab and Abihu served as high priests. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. The command was given. They offered profane fire. That was their decision. They chose to do that for whatever reason. Maybe they were lazy that day. Maybe they decided that they wanted to do it this way and it would be quicker uh, and chose to do things that way. But the command was given and they disobeyed that command that God gave. And the consequence? Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Now this was wise on Aaron's part. Um, it could have meant that Aaron was going to say something, but one of the things that comes to my mind is that in this culture, they would typically tear their clothing in grief at the loss of a loved one. Aaron's sons had just, just died at the hands of God. And Aaron knew that uh, that wouldn't be the, the proper thing to do, the wise thing to do. His life could have been taken just as his son's lives were taken as a result. And Aaron was smart in holding his peace. So we've seen two examples so far, briefly. Let's uh, delve into Hophni and Phinehas now. Again, let's start with the command. In Exodus 19.22, here the priests are given a command. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, set themselves apart, be holy, lest the Lord break out against them. Okay. 
command's been set forward. Now let's look at the beginning for uh, Eli's sons and the problem that started. Let's so turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And we'll start with verse 12, go through verse 17. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Now, before we go on, um, in Leviticus uh, 7 and 34, God says for what the priest can have and what needs to be sacrificed. God was really good to the Levites. The tribe of Levi, if you'll recall, uh, served as the mediator, the, the priest between um, the Israelites and God. They offered intercession for the Israelites. And uh, again, God was good to the people, even down to providing food for them. Eli's sons, though, chose to take more than what they should have. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, if I were an Israelite, put yourself in the, the Israelites' position, and having to go to Eli's sons to uh, offer these sacrifices, I would be a little resentful. My sacrifice would not be offered the way that God intended it to be offered. This person that serves as my mediator between me and God is uh, desecrating the sacrifice that I want to offer to, to my God. Um, one of the commentaries that I read on this passage, I didn't even think about it until... Uh, uh, I read what a commentator had to say in regard to uh, giving the meat for the priest to roast. I was under the impression, okay, maybe the uh, priest was just taking the meat that he could eat and then laying the fat on up for the sacrifice to God. The sacrifice was still being offered. But one commentator suggested that perhaps they were taking the whole thing and God wasn't seeing a bit of it. And if that's the case, that's the worst case scenario. If that's the case, um, again, the resent would be um, uh, strong. Uh, I would be an Israelite and I could do nothing about it. I could not offer this sacrifice on my own to God. Uh, continuing on, let's move on down to verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So not only were they offering sacrifices in a way that was displeasing to God, they're also sleeping with the women of Israel, and being representatives of God, again, it should not be so. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of all your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is not good, or it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord speaking abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. We're going to revisit that verse in a moment. But uh, verse 26, I think, is a beautiful contrast in what's happening here at the time. Now, the young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Uh, I think this is a beautiful contrast because here you have a corrupt priesthood. Samuel is being raised uh, to become a priest eventually, and he will speak with God directly in the chapters of our art of Paul, that we won't get in tonight. But um, there is hope for Israel that is to come. But getting back to, to uh, verse 25. If someone sins against the man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of God to put them to death. For it was the will of God to put them to death. What does this mean? What does this mean exactly? For it was the will of God. They wouldn't listen because it was God's will to put them to death. Now, I can think of one two options. One, God, in his righteous judgment, directly intervening 
to make Eli sons, not listen, to heed the correction of their father, and hasten their death, or two, God indirectly intervened to permit Eli's sons to not heed the correction of their father. Now, I am kind of leaning toward option two. I think that, that falls more in line with the scripture. And I'll explain a little bit more as we go on, but first let's visit this option one. Yes, God is a righteous God. Uh, let's look at Isaiah uh, chapter 45, verses 21 through 25. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 21 through 25. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I the Lord? And is there no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and to him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. From this passage alone, one can conclude that yes, God is a righteous God. We, as human beings, uh, have no idea what uh, righteousness God possesses. I have no ability to judge any one of you in this assembly tonight to say that based on the sin that you've committed, you are put to death. You are to be put to death. Because I'm just as righteous as any one of you. Uh, it's amazing to me that God is such a righteous and pure ind individual being that he is able to swear against himself. We are not able to, to, to do such a thing as God is able to do. He's able to make the covenant with Abraham, as we see in the Old Testament, and he swears against himself because there is none greater. Again, this is not something that we can say about ourselves. I cannot swear against myself and make a covenant with any one of you uh, based on my being, because I, again, am not righteous and pure as God is. So yes, God is a righteous judge. And one may be able to conclude that, uh, yes, God directly intervened uh, in God's righteous judgment. He had every right to do so, and to make Eli's sons disregard the correction of their father. Uh, if you look back at 1 Samuel uh, 2.25a, um, Samuel says there, If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. Uh, but if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? I think it's in, uh, yeah, in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. Uh, let's see, or chapter 4. Excuse me. Whenever Eli actually dies, in verse 18, in the very last sentence, it says, And he had judged Israel 40 years. This is Eli. He served as priest. And I believe uh, in, in one commentary that I wrote, sometimes the, the priest would serve as a judge to mediate in disagreements. And here, Eli is, is uh, telling his sons, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. The uh, priest was a representative for God, of course, and they had that right to do that. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? It's, it's only God. Again, you're back to that righteous judge. Perhaps this was only able to happen under the Old Testament. I would go with the person as far as to say, okay, maybe uh, God directly intervened. Because what we're saying here, the danger here, is that a person's free will is given up. God uh, directly intervenes, and uh, that is not good, of course, because what can I can conclude then? Okay, if my free will is given up, then what's the point of my serving God whenever it all comes down to God anyway? I have no choice in the matter. Free will is gone. That's the danger there. That's the reason why I wouldn't go with option one. So what about option two? Let's get to option two. God can't give up on the individual. It is dead set on doing what he wants to do. Whenever it's in contrary uh, to or in contrast to the will of God. 2 Corinthians 30 and 7, Psalm 81, 12, Ezekiel 20, 25, Acts 7, 42, Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and 28. All of these passages, I looked this up just this morning, and I had no idea. But there are many times in the Bible where God gave people up because they were dead set on doing what they exactly wanted to do. 
we're going to look at a couple of them. Uh, Psalm 81 and verse 12. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. In Romans 1.28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. God did not directly encourage people to sin. He cannot do that. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's what happened to Alphonse Phineas. That's what happened to Nadab and Abihu. And that's what happened, spiritually speaking, to Adam and Eve. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They had their own desire in their heart. Adam and Eve wanted to partake of that fruit. They'd have and invite you for whatever reason, wanted to offer unauthorized fire before God. And Hophni and Phinehas decided to uh, desecrate the role of being priests to the people of Israel. Can this apply to us today? Sure it can. We can continue to do what we'd like to do if we're dead set against it. I think that Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 26 and 27 supports this point. Where if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Does this mean that God will not take me back? No, of course not. Again, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, Paul warns uh, that uh, some may depart from the faith their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Uh, will God not take those people back, those people that are dead set in their ways? No, if they repent, God will take them back. The prodigal son had that same problem. Uh, he was hesitant to go back home, but he did, and he was fortunate to. But God is loving, faithful, and just to forgive us. Peter makes the point, and, and supports this point that I'm making. Yes, God will take the repentant sinner back, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 God wants the sinner to come home. So how does this apply to me? How can I take this lesson and go out those doors and think that I got anything out of this? Well, for those of you that are parents and grandparents, I can think particularly with this story on Hoffman and Phineas, it would be wise to balance a child's or grandchild's free will with correction as need be. Eli uh, seemed to let his children run willy-nilly, so to speak. Uh, they could have been stoned for what they were doing, and they could have been uh, taken out of the office of priest, but they caused Israel to sin, and Eli seemed to to turn uh, a blind eye to it. And who knows what would have happened had Eli done what he needed to do in the first place. Another thing that we can walk away from this lesson um, is that we can be reminded that God is a righteous and pure being, purer than any one of us, of course, and should be honored with reverence. And the last thing that I can think of is that with freedom of choice comes great responsibility. We can learn from the mistakes of these Bible characters. These were true stories, of course, that took place. And uh, we have history today so that history won't repeat itself over. We learn from the mistakes of other individuals. And at this time, we extend the invitation to you now. Those of you who have not obeyed the Word of God, you've heard the Word now. Do you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God? If so, confess him tonight before this assembly and repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of those sins that you repented of. If you're a Christian and you've stumbled, you've fallen, you've not done what's right, and you have repented of those sins, those things that you know to be wrong, you need the encouragement and the prayers of the church, then we also invite you to come forward right now. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What do you choose to do? Repent or perish? Choose now. Let's together we stand and sing.